right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Life Fellowship, one of the many congregations of God, Father, Son, and Spirit that he has placed on the earth as his body with Jesus as our head. I uh, speak in those terms because that's what this is about. Our head calls us uh, together. So good to see uh, most of you I recognize as past participants. This is our fifth year doing this. We started out in uh, Vienna, Virginia, and then we've been doing it here ever since around this time of the year. We try to avoid uh, weekends like this, but we, due to, to trying to match up schedules, we had to do it on Memorial Day weekend. But, so I thank you for being willing to come out on this Memorial Day weekend. Others wanted to make it, but just uh, had other family plans, which are understandable. Um, so I guess kind of because I look around and see most of you have been here before and know uh, our speaker today. I'll still say for those who may not know, Dr. Gary Detto is our guest and to teach us uh, more and we'll participate with him in understanding how Jesus is the Lord of all of life and how we participate with him by the spirit to the glory of his father. Um, again, we've been building on that foundation of God, the Trinity for five years and we'll continue to do that. He is uh, presently the president of Grace Communion Seminary and he's our doctrinal advisor. Uh, so pretty heavyweight roles uh, in the church, which primarily does have a teaching function. Uh, so I wanted to give a little context, gospel context, by reading the scripture, and then we'll ask a prayer. I want to pun Dr. Dead on our time together, and we'll let him begin. So um, what came to my mind was Ephesians chapter 4. Now, you know, sometimes they have titles over chapters in books. In my NIV version, it says, Unity and Maturity in the Body of Christ. I think that's appropriate uh, as to what's happening here today. But let me, I'll, I'll start in verse, I mean, verse 1 and read down to maybe verse uh, 11 or so. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Oh, sorry, let's see, when you were called. Yeah, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And in verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So being a preacher, you're tempted to want to talk that out, but I'm not going to. I know you all have heard that many times, but the fact is you've been called by Jesus Christ. He's given each of us a gift, a way to participate but that gift primarily is the Holy Spirit himself. So we're not stuck on various things we might do. He might do different things than us at various times. But he's called us to maturity, to faith, to remember oneness, uh, and all to the glory of the Father. That's what we're hearing about today. And he's placed gifts in the body, gifts of teaching, uh, so that we may be built up and equipped. So a large part of our role is to teach and be taught. That's a kind of a significant, usually we're thinking of putting our hands to something and always going at it that way. But there, uh, Jesus loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. It all ties together. Can't leave any part out. So thank you for coming here. We'll ask God now to give us special inspiration as we get equipped today. Our Father, we give you thanks through Jesus and in the Holy Spirit for giving us direction. You haven't left us uh, directionless. You haven't left us in chaos. Even though you're invisible, you have become visible in Christ and placed within our very humanity a proper response to looking to you and to be guided in all things. And you've sent us your Holy Spirit that we might receive freely what you have given us freely. 
And in the case of today, teachers, uh, understanding, coming together as the body of Christ, remembering we're not just uh, one church as one congregation. There are many congregations. We're to be in unity uh, as we worship you and as we witness to you. We appreciate this date on the calendar in which we too, as prisoners of you, Jesus, uh, now look to you, our head, to teach us. You alone are the great teacher. But we give you thanks that we can participate in that aspect of your nature and receive also as learners. So send your spirit to us today that we might know uh, the life and love of you, Father and Son. And we give you thanks. May all things be to your benefit. May you be glorified. Special inspiration upon the speaking and the hearing and the participating together in fellowship. So it's in Christ's name that we receive this good gift that again comes from you, our head. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. With that, I'll turn it over. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Ditto. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you again. What's been such a joy is to come back and actually recognize the same faces. Uh, and so it's familiar, even though I've traveled miles to get here, and some of you have traveled a number of miles to get here uh, as well. But it's great to be a fellowship and to come back and meet together. And uh, what we're going to cover today really builds on what we've been dealing with in the past five years, uh, and actually which GCI has been uh, dealing with, uh, kind of building one layer on, on the next over these years. So if you've been here previously, uh, you should recognize some of the things that we won't talk about in detail, but you say, oh, yeah, we talked about that. That'll be good. Um, but we're going to uh, focus on uh, a slight uh, topic uh, today, but it will build on what we've done before, and, and really kind of the emphasis of the denominations that moves around and tries to cut our bases instead of just uh, staying in uh, one on one theme or one concern. Great to be back and to continue and hopefully build you up and uh, move us all on a little bit as uh, we move forward. Wife Kathy. Uh, for a month to uh, help my uh, their third uh, uh, no and then I was down there for 10 days and then uh, came back as I live in Chicago as you may know and uh, so uh, but my daughter youngest uh, Krista also came down for the last week t uh, to help out uh, with the new the new grandson Caleb uh, is his name, and uh, now so Kathy and Krista are driving back to Chicago right now. Uh, so if you think about them, you can kind of offer prayers of, for their uh, safety. It's uh, 675 miles, <laughs> 11 hours, uh, but at least Kathy doesn't have to do it by herself. They'll be, they'll be sharing the driving and all, and Linda and little Caleb are doing well. He was born on uh, April 25th. Uh, and all, and they're both doing uh, very well, although Linda now has three boys to look after. <laughs> <laughs> so we pray for grace and mercy on her. She has, she's part of a good uh, church there, and uh, people have uh, volunteered to help out, and also we trust she's in good hands. Well, what we want to talk about uh, today is Jesus Christ, Lord of all of life. Um, and, uh, of course, I don't know if you've heard this little, it's kind of a bumper sticker uh, phrase. I don't like bumper sticker Christianity that much. But <laughs> if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Have you, have you heard that? Well, actually, that's, that's true. <laughs> that's what Lord means uh, of all. So we're going to now try to talk about that all that includes um, creation and redemption. So sometimes we align Jesus with redemption, but he's Lord of creation uh, as well, being part of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, Lord of all creation and redemption. So when we're, we're going to talk about uh, the, at, uh, we're going to talk about what we're calling whole life discipleship. That is following Jesus in and through all of life, not just church life, not just private life, not just morality, but 
all of life, the whole life discipleship, um, and try to take that in view and to uh, take that picture into view, the big picture. And then we're dividing that down in the whole life discipleship to talk about worldview and vocation. All right, so that's the subdivision. We're going to try to pack things in. I've got too much material, but we'll see what we can do uh, on making that, uh, making that go. All right, so that's, that's the basic outline um, of what we're going to try to cover uh, today. Now, let's see if I can get this to work right. Let's see. There you go. Good. Got it. All right, so this is a, a, a kind of a diagram of the whole thing. Um, because the tendency is in our minds and in our lives to have things fragment and fall apart into separate pieces rather than adding up to the oneness, the wholeness of it. It's not that easy to keep life whole and all the pieces connected and working together and being harmonized. So uh, even though we're going to talk about whole life discipleship, we don't want to think about that as a separate, independent thing that, okay, now, now GCI is in an, into a new thing. We've got a, a new fad going, so forget what's happened in the past. We're moving on because, you know, we're progressive. We're going to be out there, and, you know, all that basics we're going we're gonna to leave behind now because, you know, we're, we're mature. We're moving on. The rest of the church can stay behind. We're out ahead. Uh, well, that's just not the right picture here. So at the b base, you can see here, is we have this, the biblical revelation, which is the foundation of the faith. We never leave that behind. It is the foundation. That's why it's kind of like bigger and broader here, showing everything is built on it. We're not going to leave that behind. How many of you kind of, you know, know how to, to write? You know how to write? Probably not a lot of you have written books, Maybe, but maybe you have, or ch uh, chapters and things like that. But, and so that's pretty, you know, advanced uh, to write an essay or to, to write a devotional or something like that, or possibly to write a book or an article. But how many of you do that left the ABCs behind? <laughs> you said, I'm on to writing. I don't need the alphabet. See, is there ever time you're going to leave the alphabet behind? You see, but sometimes we can get to thinking, you know, okay, we got that biblical stuff. We know all that stuff. We can, we can leave that behind now and move on. See, there is no leaving behind. There's no moving on any more than leaving behind the ABCs in order to, to write the world's greatest novel. You see, we never leave it behind. So all of it, we need to kind of rem remember. And this is why the fundamental discipline, spiritual discipline of the church is living under the word of God. We need to hear it all the time, like we use the ABCs all the time. We need to be reminded, partly because we can forget, or things get out of focus, or we, don't, we miss a part or a piece. So going back, the most fundamental spiritual discipline of the church is listening to the Word of God and soaking in the Word of God, and that's never left behind. I don't care how advanced and progressive and kind of you know, newfangled we are, you know, new technology, new techniques, new, no, anything that's not built on that foundation is going to fail. Uh, it, it's, well, like building on sand, to use the image that Jesus did. And so everything is built on that. We're not going to leave that behind, and oh, don't think we're leaving it behind to talk about this worldview and vocation stuff. And if it is, if it's not built on the foundation, we need to throw it away. All right? Now, so GCI, all the way back, you know, has said scripture is important and we're studying scripture now how to interpret it was a problem for a while uh, but that's better sorted out but it's still built on the word of God living and written living and written well on top of that then but what was needed is uh, a theological uh, understanding of the whole of the Bible so that's an emphasis on doctrine or teaching so when we teach or when we have doctrines that summarize like our statement of belief, and now more recently uh, we've concluded uh, a, a, a resource of uh, we believe, which is a question and answer approach to try to fill out a little bit more is what is our statement of what we believe uh, 
filled out. What does it look like? And so there's more detail there. They can use it as an educational tool. In some churches, it's called a catechism. People, you know, hear that word, and well, I don't know. That sounds what too Catholic or too something, uh, and all that. But it isn't a question-answer f- format. Uh, and there's a youth edition and an adult edition. But that spells out a little bit more. But what that does is what theology does is try to take the biblical word and kind of see how all the parts fit together and to synthesize it or coordinate to see the whole counsel of God and not in fragments, in parts, even individual verses or chapters. But what does this add up to a theological understanding is the attempt to kind of put it all together and find ways of pointing to the realities that Scripture points to. So we have a theological synthesis that's summarized in doctrines, okay? So, yes, uh, being, uh, talking about the Incarnation and the Trinity is a doctrinal issue, but what that's meant to do is to summarize and bring together words, concepts, illustrations, and all that help us grasp as a whole the biblical teaching and the reality to which the biblical witness points us. And so we summarize that, the doctrine of the Trinity. You don't go to the Bible and find the doctrine of the Trinity. You find the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit over and over again, working together, being together, having the same mind, the same purpose, and all at work uh, together. And Jesus points us back and saying, well, that's who God is from even before the foundations of the earth. He was loved from before the foundations by the Father and the Spirit. So, we pull together a doctrine that summarizes it. So there is a doctrinal uh, element to it. GCI has been helped by going back to Scripture and saying, what does this add up to? And saying, is, whoops, well, it doesn't add up to that, does it? <laughs> Even though we thought it did, it's adding up to this, and it's adding up to that. Uh, like, we need to account for the new covenant. <laughs> you can't leave that out uh, and a- have it add up. And so things has to do with the change. Uh, but it didn't leave Scripture behind, but it was re-grasping the whole and making sure all the parts of the puzzle put together and not big chunks left out, because that's going to have a distorting effect. A lot of the renewal was we call a theological basis, and we got help from others who had been working on this theological synthesis together, and what it turns out is the center has to do with the Trinity Incarnation. That's the proper center of the whole thing. Uh, it's the center of the, the, the portrait when you put all the pieces together. So we say we have an incarnational and Trinitarian theology, but that's not a specialized kind of thing that we do. It's what all Christians do and have, although some of them, other, other churches or denominations or teachers don't keep it at the center. So it drifts off to the side and they may put something else at the center. Well, that's going to not have a great effect either and be helpful. So we just keep the center to the center. We keep the main thing the main thing. And our theology helps us do that. It should help us. And so our, a, a good theology helps us when we read scripture, we realize I'm reading this part, but this part, this verse occurs in the whole of scripture, you see? So our theology helps us remember when we read a little bit where it fits in the whole pattern. So that's, so our theology helps us read the Bible and our reading the Bible contributes to our theology and our theology contributes to reading the Bible to keep things together. All right, so now we spent a lot of time over the past years focusing on the uh, doctrinal or theological synthesis of the biblical foundation, okay? So, uh, but in recent years, what's realized is there are other things to incorporate into the picture, the whole picture, that aren't, ex- that aren't the center itself, but they're right around the center. That's the Christian life and the nature of the church. So, in the last couple of years, we spent time as a denomination and it's saying is you know what we've got the center here now let's see it it moves out from the center what is surrounds it what goes around it and that the Christian life church so we're 
talking about the center of the center, but we're talking out of the center. At least we should be. So we're not leaving it behind, but there are implications. There are applications uh, to, well, all of life. Not all of life is at the center. It's about all of life. That center speaks to all of life, and we want to stay not, not eccentric, off-center, but remain uh, properly centered. So this is why we say Jesus is the center of the center. All right? But there's a periphery, right? There's what surrounds the center, and you can talk about it as long as you remember what the center is. If you forget the center, it's easy to become eccentric, off-center, <laughs> and the whole thing wobbles and sometimes crashes. Okay, so now we don't want to do that. But you can talk about the periphery if you remember what the center is. It's okay. You can do it. We can talk about the nature of the Christian life. We can talk about the uh, vocation, worldview, these types of things. We can talk about all of life with Christ at the center who leads us to the Father and the Son. So the Trinity in Christ is at the center. So we are going to talk about the, you know, what is surrounds. Now, there is a danger there, right? Because you can get so concentrated on what surrounds, it becomes a center. <laughs> See? So, there is a little danger here of, of moving out from the center. But the thing is, that center is to give life. Jesus is Lord of all. So, we can move on if we remember the center. <laughs> all right? And, th and that is uh, then what we're calling the whole life discipleship. Uh, especially worldview and vocation. I'll explain more about what that is, but it's actually moving out from the center. Now, the next thing that helps... So here's a, a diagram that you've seen before. So the church itself is about two... It lives in two relationships, worship and witness. Okay? So the church has a relationship with the living God through Christ and according to his written word. So we have a R1 up there. We have a word relationship. Church lives and has its being that is around its worship of God. Which God? The God that Jesus introduces us to, that is the Father, Son, and Spirit God. That God. That's the God we worship. And so the center of the church's life is living in and enabling and fostering a worship relationship with the living God. That's who we are. So that's the most important thing. And how many other worship relationships do we have to deal with? None. Right? There's only one worship relationship. <laughs> That's it. All right? So that has a very strict focus. It's not about us. It's about God. We are here to worship not ourselves or not something or other else, but the living God revealed in Jesus Christ according to Scripture. That's the God we worship. That's what the church's life is about. Living in and moving in and having our life in a worship relationship with God. And so we call it a direct, when we do that, we're looking to God. We're focusing on who God is. We're responding to who God is, not only individually, but as congregations. And so we have worship services. This is what we do. And, of course, it, it, we're talking directly about who God is. We're considering his word directly and personally. And so it's a direct witness. It points to our words, our actions, when we take communion, right? When we gather together, when we read scripture, when scripture is preached, right? All this points directly. It's talking about God in terms of the word of God that God gives us. So it's a direct witness. It points directly to it. Um, and so we honor God by directly pointing to him. So that's why I'm calling a direct witness in that. All right, so that's, let's call that the vertical relationship. All right, so but that comes down among us in worship. So the little circle in the center is our worship. This is where we live. God comes down to us and to be with us and speaks his word to us. And so we, the church, then are worshiping now. But we also have horizontal relationships, right? We worship God, and that comes down. And we, we worship God here in time and space, now in body and mind. We worship. So the little circle that mirrors, right, the, the circle above, the real God 
who is there has come down and we can worship here and now in time and space um, and in words and music and all kinds of ways. All right, but then we have wider relationships. So I'm calling that relationship R2, the witness relationship that is in, when we're in the world in relating to others, who are we? What are we? We are those who bear witness to who and what? To the living God, the one we worship. So what we do in our actions and in our words and in our relationships, uh, we mirror that, we point to that. And we can use words and we can use deeds. There's lots of ways to point to it, to who we are and who everyone is and who the Lord is of everything. So we have our horizontal relationships in our family, in our churches, in our schools, in our work, all these kind of relationships that we live with horizontally. But we don't worship them, okay? There's one worship relationship. But what we do is we live in a way that mirrors who we are and who God is. All right, so those are, in, in that way, a lot of times we don't speak directly about who Jesus is. We don't kind of spout our doctrines off necessarily at work <laughs> or in school. Uh, but we try to live consistently with it, but we may not say anything. It may be indirect. That's okay. It can be indirect. That's fine. Um, our worship relationship is where we're direct, but we're, we can be, have an indirect worship. We're still who we are. We know who we are in relationship to God and who we worship and not other things. And so our witness that goes out that points to God is an indirect worship. Okay? It still reflects who we are and what we are, even if it's not explicit, it's not direct. So we become parables in the world. Right? They kind of raise questions. And sometimes people will give us opportunities to be direct. <laughs> and so we can actually invite them, for instance, to come and join us in our worship. Or they can see us, well, if you really want to know what's going on and hear about who we are, what we believe and what we live by, come to our worship service, then you'll be at the center and hear about the center of the center. You see, so we invite people in. So two basic relationships, worship and witness. Okay, that's where the church is. Now, okay, so that last, so you have these because sometimes I can't go back and forth on that. So you have the worship relationship handout to remind you of that. Now this one, okay, this is the most complicated. This is where we're going to end up. All right, so don't worry about, you can't pick this all out now. Don't. I, this is just to show you where you're going. But this circle here, okay, up there is the flat circle laid out here. Okay, that's this. But just all the pie shapes I, I left out of this one. It's got the same center, but it's got stuff around it. Okay, so just think of uh, this, I call it the relationship wheel. But anyway, that's that laid out flat. Okay, these are our wider witness relationships. And it's very, there's all kinds of things going on there. And we'll talk about those because uh, there's all kinds of things we do and are involved in and are related to. But notice it's got the same center, the Father, Son, and Spirit. And then around it, if you'll see, you'll see it's the kind of the church uh, is around it. And then around that are what I'm calling our wider cultural relationships. So that's our three. We have church relationships, and then we have the wider relationship. Uh, whoops. With outside. Let's see, did I completely go in a different direction? No, that's just the next one. Okay, so do you see how that works? That's where we're going. We're going to try to fill this all out and ask in those wider relationships. See, this is where we're building in the worldview and the vocation. These are these wider relationships around the church and around the center of its worship of the Father, Son, and Spirit in Christ according to the word. That's where we're going. Okay, so don't worry about it. We'll come back uh, to this. All right, um, let's see. Let me, I need to advance my thing here. All right, so let's go back and just review briefly, because this is what we talked about previously, the nature of the church in Ephesians, right? We're no longer strangers, uh, but we're citizens built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And you don't go building off the foundation. 
But usually you have to keep asking, are we on the foundation? Are we on the foundation? Because if you don't, it's easy to kind of build, you know, add an addition to the house that's not on the foundation. <laughs> uh, and so you can keep, you have to keep track of that. Um, so there's a foundation of the apostles and prophets. So again, there's the biblical foundation, the teaching of the apostles uh, and the prophets. But Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the center of the center. Everything is measured according. So I don't know if you remember uh, kind of the next uh, one here. Uh, this one, right? That's the cornerstone. It's Christ himself. It's not his teachings, right? It's he himself. It's not even what he did for us. It's he himself, which includes what he did for us, right? He's the cornerstone. And then, yes, what forms the rest of the foundation is the teaching of the apostles, the prophets that he appointed, all right? So he lent, and he says, as you can trust these guys, my spirit is specially upon them. So this is scripture. So this is all our life. The lordship is going to be built on this. All right. So we don't leave behind the study of scripture because it's the word living, Jesus Christ himself, the living word and the written word. So paying attention to that. All right. And then we're built on that. So notice if you're built on that foundation, then the life of Christ then begins to be reflected in each one. That's why you have the little crosses, right, in each of the other little cubes, which can represent our families or our congregations or even individuals. They start taking on the shape of the foundation they're built on because they're in communion, they're in communication with it, they're in correspondence, they're in a worship relationship with it. And so we become like what we worship. It's interesting, people even found out, people even become like their animals, especially their dogs. <laughs> you become like what you love. You become like what you worship. You see? And so, yes, we become like as we build on the foundation. There's going to be pressures to move off the foundation too, but we can come back. And so there's a likeness, right? They're all kind of cubes. In a way, they're in different locations, but they're all cubes. They all have the same shape. This is conformity to Christ. All right, so this is, um, and let's see what the next one. All right, so here you have it. I put in another way, the living word, right, which is Jesus Christ himself. And on that then comes out of the written word. And then on that, our lives are built. It's just another way to show the same thing. Now, our lives are going to be built to deal with those wider relationships. Okay, that's where we're going. But this, we've got to build up from it. So th this is all review for you. And then, how do you go about it? Well, this should remind you also of what we covered in before, is built on the Word of God, living and written, there are, th this tells us, indicates God's grace towards us in that worship relationship. We found this God is a God of grace, a God of life, who gives us life and gives us a real relationship with him where you can receive from him and reflect back. So we find the indicatives of grace, all of what God, who God is. God says, this is who I am. I am the Lord your God who takes you out of all kinds of Egypts, <laughs> slaveries, and sets you free. I am the Lord your God who came to you in the Son and who gave his life for you that you might have life in him. So there's all these indications of all of who God is, the God of grace, and what he's done for us. And that's just all indicated. It's just telling us the truth and the reality. So there it is. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. There you go. It's there. It's a reality. It's indicating, right? Pronouncing, proclaiming, what the truth and what the reality is of who God is and why he's done it and how it's for us. All right, so we have the indicatives of grace. But as you know, scripture doesn't leave us there. What it does is, well then, if I'm counting on that, then my life will be lived out in a certain way. So you have the imperatives or the commands of grace. So live according to this. If God has loved you, then love your neighbor. If God has forgiven you, Forgive your neighbor. See, there's a correspondence. Everything, work out your salvation because God is at work in you. 
So built on that, this is why you have all kinds of commands in Scripture and exhortations throughout the New Testament to keep us living on the basis of our faith that's proclaimed to us in Scripture and is lived out and given to us in Christ, the living word. All right? So that we have, there are uh, uh, imperatives. I mean, the New Testament wouldn't be written. The letters have all, uh, right, from Paul and, and others and Peter and others, they have imperatives. They're all in there. Now, the problem is illegalism is when you have an imperative, a command that's separated from the indicatives of grace that are fulfilled in the New Covenant. If you start taking the commands out and just trying to do it on your own, that's legalism. This is the obedience that's not built on faith. It's not what Paul says is, I've only come to do one thing. My ministry is about to bring about the obedience that belongs to, that sets on faith in the indicatives of who God is and what he's done for you and is doing and will do. All right, so the problem is if you concentrate on the imperatives and the commands and it gets off the foundation, it becomes a legalism that kills. But that doesn't mean there aren't any imperatives or commands. Because the other problem is, is to kind of dismiss them and saying, as well, it's all done. And I guess I just like go on my merry way. Who knows? Uh, no, there's a certain pattern of life that arises out of that, that the imperatives, the commands say, no, go in this direction. Forgive your neighbors. <laughs> you see, I, because you are forgiven. See, it's all built on that. So, but sometimes, you know, if our concern says, is, well, the only way we know for the church to be faithful is just make sure you're not legalistic. That's it. Just make sure you're not legalistic and all will be well. Just don't, don't commit that problem, okay? You see, but that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story. The Christian life it cannot be, won't be lived in a fulfilling way by just saying, is, well, at least I'm not legalistic. Well, I'm very legalistic about not being legalistic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud about not being legalistic. And I'm so superior to other Christians who are. You see, that, that can get you into a trap, can it? You see, there are lots of kind of legalisms and all. And of course, if you don't, aren't concerned about obedience, the obedience that comes from faith, see, then that leads to what's called antinomianism, where the Christian life is just random. Like, whatever, God's grace will cover it. So you end up presuming upon the grace of God, which is not to put your faith in it. But this is an easy slippage to presume upon. It, the grace of God's operating. So whatever. You know, it doesn't make any difference. It's all on autopilot. I'll just kind of cruise through and do whatever. Uh, no, we're given instructions as to how to build on that. So, but you do have to watch that the commands, the imperatives, the encouragements, the exhortations, that you see how they grow out of the indicatives of grace on the basis of the new covenant, on the basis of who Christ is, on the basis of the grace of God. Then the Christian life will not be legalistic because our obedience then will be a freedom and joy and a coherence to our lives will be receiving from God and responding. All right? So the Christian life can't be just say, well, we're just not legalistic and we're done. We don't need to think about it anymore. Uh, part of it is, what, how do we find the obedience of faith and keep that on track, properly uh, oriented? All right? So the, the commands of grace. God... By giving us commands and saying, is, look, to walk in my grace is to walk in this direction, not in that direction. That's God being gracious. His commands aren't mean. He's saying, you need some help here, navigating, staying on track. So, but make sure it's never disconnected from the, my grace that you can count on no matter what. So though everyone be faithless, God will be faithful to get us back on track. <laughs> you see, but not in a legalistic way. All right, so these are kind of the past lessons hopefully we've learned.
And so, yes, so who is this Jesus, the foundation? Just to review here how it's related to the Trinity, Jesus is one in being with the Father, one in being with the Holy Spirit, but he's distinct in his person as the eternal beloved Son. He's the Son. He's not the Spirit. He's not the Father, but he's one in being with them. So that's what adds up to Jesus being Lord. Why is he Lord? Because he's one with the Father and one with the Spirit. And the Father and the Spirit are one with him. But that doesn't make him the Father. He's distinct in person, we say. And so this, this is why you have the Trinity. But the whole Trinity is Lord, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father's Lord, the Son's Lord, the Spirit's Lord, they're, because they're one in being. So Jesus is Lord of all because he's part of the Trinity. <laughs> Or a person of the Trinity. I shouldn't actually use the word part. But, okay, you see that? So where does his lordship come from? Now we'll find out that all things, of course, were created by the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. Creation was a triune event. So that's exercising his lordship. We'll talk more about that later. And so Jesus is Lord from all eternity because he's united in being with the Father and the Spirit. And he's equal in being, equal to be worshipped. This is why we worship the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. He is equal in authority, equal in power from all eternity. And so he has all the attributes, we say, of God. He's divine. That makes him Lord. All right? So he's equal in being with the Father and the Spirit, as well as being united. But he's unique in person. So he's, they're not mushed all together. They're distinct in person because there's real relationships going on in God from all eternity. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Son has always been the Son. The Father's always been the Father and the Spirit's always been the Spirit because God is a communion and fellowship of loving, glorifying, and knowing one another. We know that primarily because Jesus tells us. That's the only way to know it. And kind of, he ought to know. <laughs> since that's where he came from. He's telling us, he's giving us insider knowledge, his insider knowledge, about who God is, even the being of God, being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he's distinct in person, all right, but he's equal in being, and he's united uh, with him, and of course that's what we mean by he's Lord. Lord of all, in the same way that the Father's Lord and the Spirit's Lord. Not in a different way. That is, having a different kind of lordship. All right? So, now, Jesus, now, but Jesus is our Lord. That's why I have that emphasized up there. How is he our Lord? Well, he's one in being with the Father. He's one in being with the Holy Spirit. He's distinct in his person. But, the last point down there, how does he become our Lord? Really, he's one in nature with us, the new head of humanity. See, by joining himself to us, he's now our Lord. He's not Lord out there, over there, and just above us, although he is. But he's now our Lord with us as one of us. Truly ours, you see. We belong to him and he belongs to us. So he's really our Lord. Not an alien Lord, but ours of human beings who took on our flesh. See, you see how that makes him our Lord? He's not just our Lord. He's just, I'm Lord. So there, from up here. You don't have any choice about it. You see, you can have that guy idea of lordship from above and from apart just as a matter of, of power, you know, and strength. And like, if you don't like it, I'm just going to obliterate you. So there, because I got the power. Right? You can think about lordship in that way. There is a lordship over. God is lord over us. But see, he's saying, is, but my lordship is different. My lordship can come down and be right with you, among you as one of you, to bring you to God. That's God's kind of lordship. So he really is our lord. Not somebody else's. He's not just kind of lord for God. He's truly our Lord. This is the amazing thing. The humility of God to come down and be our Lord is one of us. So see, this is what makes him, in an even deeper sense, truly Lord. Not just Lord over us, but Lord with us. And then by the Holy Spirit, Lord in us. You got it. 
See, that's an amazing lordship, isn't it? Is there any other lord like this? And you see, it requires God being. It arises from God being triune. We can think about it in a way. The Father over us, the Son with us, and the Spirit in us. Lord three times. Lord three ways. Really, Lord. Over us. In us. With us. There's no other Lordship like this. That's because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has the nature and character to want to be Lord in this way with His creation. That's an amazing thing. That's why we worship this God. No other Lordship like it. All right? So, this is how He's our Lord. So, this is summarized in the early church. They had a, 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 a uh, kind of a simple way of bringing this together. He who is the Son of God by nature, just because that's who He is. <laughs> nothing had to happen. Nothing had to be willed. Nothing had to be accomplished. He's the Son of God from eternity by nature. By grace became also a son of man, one of us. By grace. Now he had to choose and decide and to do something or other to share our human nature. So, by grace, he became also a son of man. Why? So that we who are sons of men, human beings, right? So we who are the sons of men, by nature, you don't have to do anything. It's like, bam, there you are. <laughs> You're giving it for a human being. Okay, there you are. That's by nature. Right? Nothing has to be decided or done. It's just there. But by grace, God entering in, doing, deciding, doing, acting, bringing something about that didn't exist before, that we might also become sons of God. So you see the switch? The eternal Son of God comes down to be one with us so that we can become the true children and sons of God. This is a very handy, easy way to remember that. But you have to see as we become the children of God by grace, not by nature, by the mighty act of His Lordship to enable us to be His children, true sons of God, by grace. So God's grace acts upon nature and raises it up to enable it to be something it could never be on its own. That is, by nature. All right. So you have the. This is called the wonderful exchange. He who is the son of God becomes the son of man, so that we are the sons of men might become sons and children of God. What an amazing thing! Is there any salvation like this? No. Yeah. See, this is this is how God exercises His lordship. So we're talking about the center of the center, but everything's going to be built on this. So don't forget it. <laughs> All right. So this makes Jesus our Lord by two things, by creation and redemption. Both, creation and redemption. So there's two acts of God. God didn't have to create. Creation does not exist forever. God exists forever. But there was a time when God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, let's create. And then they said, yeah, but what if it goes wrong? They're not going to be perfect like us. Can we handle it? Do we know what to deal with it? He said, yeah. If it falls, and we can anticipate that it can, we can pay the price. We can also redeem what we've created. And so Jesus is Lord in two ways. By virtue of creation and by virtue of redemption. Now the important thing here... Um, well, and so what about the creation? So sometimes we forget about this. Again, it's a piece of the puzzle that can be off to the side, but it's important to be brought into the whole picture is the one through whom all things were created is the one through whom all things are redeemed. So the Father creates through the Son in the Spirit and the Father redeems, right, through the Son in the Spirit. Well, that makes sense. If He creates through the Son, it seems appropriate that He would also redeem through the Son, right? And that's the picture we, we see. So, yes, it's the same one. He's Lord. Creation, redemption. Created through Him, redeemed by Him. It kind of adds up. It makes sense. It's fitting. Mm -hmm. You say creator and redeemer, and you use the word if that creation goes bad. 
Didn't he know that Peter would go bad? Yeah, well, that's what I said he anticipated. Yes, certainly. But there was a time when there wasn't the creation, is the point I'm bringing out there. But yes, God, God anticipates everything. And, and so the, it's, this is why from the foundations of the earth, Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, yes, God understands and was willing to pay the price. But it is rolled out in time. In other words, it doesn't happen simultaneously because creation exists in time and space. So what God does to deal with creation, he has to deal with it according to his nature. It's a time-space reality, and so it rolls out. It doesn't just happen in an instant. Um, so God respects the nature of his creation, namely that it's not God. <laughs> creation does not exist like God exists, so he deals with it and pays the price uh, for it. So yes, it's anticipated. Certainly didn't catch God off guard. He understood what it would, and they decided in saying, can we afford to do this? Do we want to do it? <clears throat> it's going to cost us a lot. Can we afford it? Do we want to do it? And the answer was, amen. Yes and Amen. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit decided together, of course, of one mind, one purpose, in saying, yeah, we'll create it and we'll redeem it. But that is rolled out, as it were, in time and space. So let's see, what do we have here? <coughs> okay. Um, now, one of the tricky things here is because, see, when we're talking about these wider cultural relationships, we're talking about creation. Okay. In our worship relationship, often we concentrate on redemption. Well, that's okay, because that's the center of the center. But if we're the redeemed people, we're the redeemed people, uh, the created people. And the God who redeemed us is the creator and redeemer of everything. So, but when we move on, we're going to talk about the nature of creation. So if we haven't talked about Jesus' relationship to creation and only redemption, we're not quite ready to deal with creation. <laughs> so this is what we're trying to do, get ready. Uh, for it. But one of the problems is, yes, because Jesus is Lord of all, they are both, as it were, creation, and then within creation, the act of redemption that God comes down and does, he is uh, both under the lordship of Christ. But creation is not redemption. They're not to be identified or confused. And this is some problems here. You can find it in official theology and in regular preaching. And teaching where people aren't quite as careful or haven't brought together the number of pieces is the creation is the object of God's redeeming work. This is the grace that comes in and brings about a new thing within a fallen creation. All right. So creation doesn't redeem itself. He doesn't like build in a mechanism and saying is, well, this will just kind of uh, give eternal life to itself. And so nothing needs to happen. In other words, grace doesn't, God doesn't need to come down and do something in time and space to bring about something it cannot bring about itself. So creation is the object of Christ's personal act and gift of redemption at his own cost. So the in, if Christ was just incarnate and did not live his life and was not crucified, and was not resurrected, was not ascended, we would not be redeemed even though everything was created through Christ. If that's all he did and said, well, that's it. I'm done. I've created it. I'm finished here. Just let it roll out, whatever. It's like, no, that's not the biblical view or teaching. What is created and then is fallen needs to be redeemed by a special act of God. That's what we call grace. And grace isn't nature. Grace isn't nature just rolling out and you know, having its effects cause and effects. Grace is the intervention of God in person in a certain time, in a certain place, in a certain person to bring about a certain work so that nature doesn't just follow where it goes. What's the wages of sin is death. That's where nature goes once it's fallen. So the incarnation alone does not save us. The atoning work of Christ had to be done in time and space and in his own body and mind. Yes, and that was a real cost. If there wasn't this cost, if there wasn't this work. So, we see the connection between Christ and creation in terms of his person. 
His person is, I'm Lord of creation and Lord of redemption. That's his person. But the person comes to do a work. A very specific work. And if he came as just his person, I'm incarnate, and never did the work, then his redemptive purpose would not be brought about. He came to do a work. But he came. Who? The Lord of creation and the Lord who is our Redeemer. He came, but he came to do a work. A saving work. And so you can't separate the person from the work or the work from the person. But you can't collapse in saying the person is the work or the work is the person or incarnation saves us in and of itself. The incarnation does not save us in and of itself. Now, there's, is the incarnation an amazing thing? Yes, we already talked about that. Our Lord. That's an amazing thing. But our Lord is our Redeemer. I don't know. Is that even a more amazing thing? Yeah, at a cost. At a price. And if He didn't pay it, we wouldn't be redeemed. So we cannot separate the, the person of Christ, the incarnate one, the Lord of all, from His saving work. But we can't collapse them either. And just saying the work is the person, the person is the work, or the incarnation is our salvation. All I need to do is be incarnate. Now I know there's some confusion out there. It's been in the church a while and you can hear people talk this way as if all we need to do is pronounce and tell people about the incarnation. And that's it. That's the whole message. Well, it isn't the whole message. Do we want to leave out the incarnation? Absolutely not. Now what's happened, what the Torrances and Bart did and others that we've benefited from, what they saw is there was a lot of emphasis in the church on the work of Christ and a neglect of the person of Christ and the incarnation. So they, tried, they brought about, attempted to deliberately bring about a correction not to get rid of the work of Christ. <laughs> but to bring in the connection between the incarnation and the work. See, the church was preaching the cross, but they didn't talk about who's on the cross. Does it make any difference who's on the cross? Yes. Absolutely. Those two guys on the right and left of Jesus were not our Redeemer. Why? It's because of who they, well, who they weren't. Why was the one... In the middle, our Redeemer. Yes. And who took on our humanity in order to redeem it. And so it, the church had been neglecting who was on the cross. So you have to bring in, the in, here's the work, that's up and running in the church. And they saw that the incarnation, who he was, one with us and one with God, was missing. So Barton, Torrance, and others Brought, tried to bring that in and saying is, look, these two help us understand each other. You understand the work in terms of the person and the person in terms of the work. They're not identical, but they have to be brought together. But now what can happen is you can kind of de-emphasize the work. Now what do you got? You have the opposite problem. Now we're talking about the person of Christ in the incarnation and leaving out the work. Well, see, Bart and the Torrances and others who saw this problem, that is not what they were trying to do. They were not just saying, here's the work, let's get rid of that, let's bring the incarnation in. That is not what they were trying to do. But there are some. See, this is the problem. When you, when you have a problem and you want to correct it, everything becomes about the correction. And you forget what you're correcting. See, this is the kind of thing, is let's not be legalistic. Okay. That's good. Get rid of that. But then, what's the place of the obedience of faith? You've got to bring that back in. In a whole new way. In a whole new framework. So, similarly with the incarnation. The person does the work. The work does the person. They're not identical, but they're related and you need to understand them together. That's what these great theologians were attempting to do. But you can overcorrect. 
And that becomes its own problem. And so, you see, if you kind of only preach the incarnation, you see, you can think the incarnation saves us. That's all I needed to do. Rather than saying is, no, the one who did the work is the incarnate one and his work as the incarnate one who came to do a special work then is the one who saves us. Incarnation, so creation and redemption. Both together. They cannot be separated, but they cannot be collapsed into one and the same. So if you hear some teaching... <laughs> You, you might want to be sensitive to that because now in some pockets there's in some ways an overcorrection is what I'd call it. Something like that. Um, as if the incarnation would take care of the whole thing. Let's see. We'll take a break. Here, in a, um, here we go. So to summarize, the creation is not self-redeeming. It's not built into it. Uh, and Or d is not... It's not a creation that doesn't require grace. It does. The actual infusion of an action of God in person to accomplish something or other in time and space, in flesh and blood, as one of us. Right? And it requires, in, yes, it does require incarnation. The actual coming of God to be with us. It's not, a creation is not requiring no costly atonement. <laughs> it requires it. All right, I put this in the negative. Maybe I should have put it in the positive. It, uh, right? it requires a resurrection. Creation requires resurrection from the dead. All right? That's a special act. It requires an ascension. And it requires a completion beyond our age, this age. All right? This is what Christ is doing. All right? The person and the work. The person with the work. Uh, both. Redemption requires, here's the positive, this is better, a personal triune God who decides, who acts, who intervenes personally and directly, who reworks everything at his own costly personal uh, triune goodness. And it's actually he works to overcome evil with good, overcome evil and death, and to put things right, body and soul, mind and spirit, Right? Mind and heart. The whole of the human being, all its created parts are redeemed. Now, part of it. So here you see creation and redemption coming together. He's redeeming the whole of the human person. The whole of creation. But that requires a special act. A special decision. A special accomplishment that is by grace injected into. He came into his world and his world knew him not. It had to come from the outside. It wasn't just a development, an evolution. Salvation is not an evolution of creation that's fallen, just naturally working out with God watching from a distance saying, well, there it goes. I set it up. It'll happen. I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to do anything about it. I don't need to pay any price myself. I can stay at a distance and let it happen. See, there it goes. Um, that's not the nature of it. So redemption requires the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. It really does. Those things don't happen. There wouldn't be our participation in his redemption. So the sum of redemption is God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. That's one of the simplest ways to say it. If you think you can do it for yourself anyway, yeah, Jesus did it for me, but I could have done it. Right? That's the problem. That's not the gospel. That's not grace. At best, that's nature saving itself by itself. With maybe, yes, a potential God kind of built into it mechanically, impersonally, indirectly. Um, let's see. So other verses, and we'll wrap up this section for it. Here to talk about, there's all kinds of teaching about Jesus' relationship to all of creation. And so we can talk about that as long as we don't forget redemption. <laughs> right? You see what I'm saying? But it's okay. I think part of the problem is we've got to focus on redemption so much that we forgot about Jesus' relationship to creation. That's a problem too. But you don't want to switch for the opposite problem. <laughs> Jesus just related to 
creation and forget about the special work of redemption. See, that, you don't want to swap one problem for another. <laughs> you want to keep the whole thing together. And so, yes, all things came into being through him. Without him was not one thing that came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life is the light of all people. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. So he had to do something about that. Right? So there you see creation and then finally redemption brought together. But all things are through him. There's a couple more verses here and then. So he is the image of the invisible God. This is his deity. But he's also the firstborn from among all creation. He's the one to lead all creation into its inheritance. For in him all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created, here's the kicker, through him, and for him. Jesus is very <laughs> tightly related to creation. He's the redeemer of the creation. The one through whom uh, uh, things are created is the one through whom things are redeemed. But they're not one and the same thing. They're two actions. He himself is before all things. And uh, you could also translate that, but the contrast. He is before all things. His deity over everything. And in him, all things hold together. In him. That's why things hold together. At all. So, Jesus has, yes, just as much to do with creation as he does redemption. You can also find this in Romans 11.36. From him, to him, through him, are all things. And so, to him, be the glory forever. Amen. He's Lord of all. Or in 1 Corinthians 8.6. For thus there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, sharing the same Lordship, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. All right, so there's a lot of teaching on the relationship of Jesus being uh, on the creator side of things and creation being Related, And then the last, in these last days, Hebrews really brings this home as well. In the last days, he's spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir to inherit all things. So the one through whom is to inherit all things. Through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact print, imprint of God's very being. That's his deity. And he sustains all things. Sustains, keeps it going. All things by his word. And, now here's the redemptive part, when he had made purification for sins. See, something has to happen. Something has to take place of this creation that he's over. He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, saying, it is finished. So creation and redemption. But yes, don't forget the creation part. Don't forget the incarnation part. But don't forget the work of grace that the incarnation is a part of, but the work is as well. Okay, we're going to take a break. Just...